Okay, some of you may have seen a version of this before. This is uh, the 2020 version. First things, um, this was inspired by the Comback or Model Railroader article starting off with, uh, I think, the classic, the beer line, and it kind of gave me ideas. And when I saw, saw this and at a convention I went to in Morgantown, West Virginia, I said, hey, wait a minute, we could do something like that. So anyway, uh, most people don't think of the Pennsylvania Railroad as being a major player in Louisville, but for 100 years they were in that. So we're going to talk about the Arbogast Street branch. Hopefully you can pick out some details or things that you might find interesting to model. Well, wait a minute. Got to hit the right button. Okay. What was and is the Arbogast Street branch? Uh, you can see the, the uh, distance and that on it. Uh, this was taken from uh, 1945 Pennsylvania Railroad publication. So that's kind of where some of the information came from. It ran from 14th Street in Louisville, which you'd have a hard time finding today, to 28th Street, running from east to west. It served approximately 32 industries and four distilleries and three cigarette companies. Some people have said it was a branch based on vice, whichever, maybe. Okay, a little bit of the history. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad through, its, uh, through the Jeffersonville, Madison, and Indianapolis Railroad came into Louisville in 1870 with the opening of the Louisville Bridge Company's Ohio River Bridge. This was the first bridge, railroad bridge across the Ohio River that actually connected north and south. There was one in West Virginia, but it connected the east with the west. The picture is the first official train across the bridge. Uh, it entered Louisville and came down 14th Street. There's actually were people living along the street, but they got it quickly evicted, and the railroad kind of took over the whole thing. This is from the 1920s, showing it when it was still at grade at Chestnut Street. And you can see the semaphores signaling Sometimes there was as many as 80 movements a day over this stretch of track. Passenger trains, freight cuts, light engines, all sorts of traffic moving back and forth. Looking southward from on the same branch, you can see the tracks curving off to your left past the sign that says Louisville Paper Company that went to L&N's Union Station. A lot of the Pennsylvania trains terminated there and then some through trains from the north went on through. Um, to the, in the distance is uh, Maple Street Tower and beyond that is where is the Kentucky Street branch which went, ran to the Illinois Central, but coming off was the Arbogast Street branch. Uh, built in 1881, this maps from 1883, you can kind of see that eventually, that originally it served a tannery at 18th Street. Uh, pretty simple. Mr. Byrne, who actually built the track, was a large coal dealer in the Louisville area. Uh, we're going to take a trip along the branch going from uh, east to west, making a few stops and looking at a few things along the way. What we're looking at here is the railroad is 14th Street, the north-south railroad. Uh, Maple Street Yard was the sorting yard where uh, the local the cars would be brought and then sorted out for delivery onto the branch. You see some of the industries, Arbacher Coffee Company, the Shenley Bottling Plant and Shenley Burnham Distillery, which was pretty much the same place. Uh, Connor Manufacturing, um, Goodwin Preserves, American Tobacco, and Philip Morris, which had been the original Louisville Axton Fisher plant. A little bit of a detail, just showing a little bit. There's also some industries that came off to the north paralleling it. I'm really not going to cover them, but that was such things as Louisville Varnish and a lumber company. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like today. Uh, you can see the mainline track or Kentucky Street branch to your left, heading off in the distance to now the Paducah and Louisville yard. And off to your right is the Arbogast Street lead. And the yellow dumpster is about where the Maple Street yard was. Uh, Sanborn insurance maps, a great resource if you're trying to research anything, especially railroad-wise, if you can get to them, they have all sorts of things. This kind of shows you the trackage plan and industries. Uh, penciled in from time to time you'll see uh, uh, other industries. Those were what they were on the 1928 version of this map. This dates from I believe 75 or 77. Um, so you can kind of see how 
uh, the track, he's kind of a spaghetti bowl of tracks there. Um, model railroad planning say don't do that, but however, in the real world, they did. So this is the Arbacher Coffee Company as it appears today, no longer Arbacher Coffee. And, uh, but anyway, it was a major uh, industry on the track. Uh, if you're looking west, uh, your Arbacher building is on your right. The spur track to Arbacher went underneath about where the car is. Also, you can see in the gravel to the right, uh, traces of the old trackage. Every once in a while, you can kind of pick out where it was as it rails poked through the gravel or whatever. An interesting feature of this building was the bumper post. In order to make room for cars, the car snuggled right up against the wall of the building. You see it's a reinforced concrete. It had a springs in there to take care of any overrun and say a guy, a little industrious engineer went too far. Considering that all the years that was probably there, I don't think they made many mistakes, if any. Uh, across the street was the Bernheim bottling plant or the distillery. Uh, it was built after the distillery was opened back up following prohibition. Uh, you can see boxcars on the siding. I think it's an unusual building. It would make a great model if somebody really wanted to work at it. It may have some problems trying to get the, the curved windows, but to me, it's a typical Art Deco style building. Uh, an odd feature for distilleries and breweries at the time was that they had to have the bottling facility separated by a roadway of some sort between it and the production facility. This was so the revenue service could go back and hopefully monitor and make sure that they weren't paying all their taxes on everything. I don't know how good that all worked, but anyway, that's what they tried. Here's a postcard view of the bottling building when it was new, uh, a lot of stuff airbrushed out, but you can get a good idea of what the building itself looked like. And here it is today. And it's still a neat building in my opinion. A little further west was the Bernheim Whiskey Warehouses. This is at 16th Street. And you can see boxcars on the siding over there. And uh, where the kids are pulling the wagon across the track, you can see two or three tracks are there in the street itself. And we are on Arbogast Street, looking slightly east. Uh, a little bit further to the east, to the west, um, we see uh, the American Tobacco Company, the plant up on Broadway, and the way the tracks curved off what I'm gonna call the main line of the branch between those buildings, between Connor Preser uh, Manufacturing, who made roofing material, and Goodwin Preserving Company, which made jams and jellies, uh, up to the American Tobacco Company. General Box Company was interesting. Uh, I think I counted, uh, I think somewhere around nine or so box, 10 box cars in this particular section of this picture. There's more box cars to the north side of the building. You're looking west to the north side of the building. Notice all the lumber, uh, piles of lumber. Remember, in those days, boxes were made out of wood, not cardboard. It wasn't really until after World War II you started seeing a lot of cardboard boxes. So this was basically a woodworking plant when you got down to it. Uh, again, a little detail, Goodwin preserving. Uh, you can see where the track that curved around Connor Man Manufacturing Company that served the backside of the General Box Company. Goodwin Preserving, I thought was another one of those signature buildings on the branch, which could be a great scratch building thing, or maybe some of the Walters uh, Cornerstone modular kits. Uh, anyway, here's a pretty com neat complex. You had the manufacturing building itself where they made the jams and jellies, a boiler room, and an office. And uh, this picture probably dates from around 1905, and you kind of tell from the site type of boxcar that's there. Uh, this is how the spur track served uh, good when it came off of the main line. The other track says railroad spur uh, was going to the American Tobacco Company. Uh, this is a couple of pictures of the Goodwin plant uh, showing the ghost signs, as a lot of people call them nowadays. As the signs faded, they would repaint, but not always exactly on top of the other one. Uh, the Goodwin building is in the background. You can see the water tank was long gone. The uh, white building to your left is the part of the Connor building. You can see it's curved to, mat to uh, fit the branch that came around. And there was probably a siding 
on the building to your right, but I've never seen any maps or anything showing it, but taking the loading door and there's room for it, I'm sure there was one. Uh, this is a track diagram from Conrail, and it shows the American Tobacco Company plant. By this time, Philip Morris had taken over the plant and was using it primarily for storage. You can see where the tracks curved around the plant. You had two, spur, two spurs, more or less, on either side. And interesting enough, a coal track. And you make you wonder, why would a tobacco manufacturer need a coal track? Well, let's look at the postcard view of the plant. Uh, we're looking, this is made around 19, before 1940, and I got some evidence of that. But anyway, uh, you can see a boxcar on the uh, east side or left-hand side of the plant. You can see the two tracks. The other side is hidden, but you also see a steam plant back there. It took a lot of steam to make tobacco, make cigarettes and cure the tobacco, get it ready. And that's where the coal track went was that power plant in the back or steam plant. Uh, this is a view of the American Tobacco Company plant later on when it was used for warehousing. And you can still see that the, the evidence of the track in the uh, uh, street and in the uh, pavement that went to the plant. Okay, heading a little further east, getting back on our switch engine and trundling westward, uh, we uh, come to the uh, Brown Foreman plant. We're now crossing Dixie Highway. At some point, uh, I think in the early 20th century, the track was extended westward. And you can see the Philip Morris plant to the north, had a siding to it and General Box Company had several more, had two warehouses, and the Nabisco Company also had a, a facility. This is a kind of a picture of Brown Foreman. If you look down at the bottom right-hand corner, you see a bunch more boxcars on the branch, and you see a track that curved off the branch southward through the plant. Also, you see the signature water tank by the smokestack. The huge whiskey bottle is kind of the signature of Brown Foreman distillery complex. I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but it kind of gives you an idea uh, from a Sanborn insurance map uh, of showing all the facilities and how they were built and how the tracks, you can't always trust the track plans on Sanborn maps, but by the time you put it together with some other things, you can, get, you can figure out what's right and what's not. Uh, here's a publicity photo showing a Pennsylvania switch engine on the branch. You can kind of read this publicizing and selling this brand, uh, a whole car load of whiskey. Obviously, this is not a real sign. It was prepared by a commercial artist on top of the picture. However, it does give you a good idea of, of what some traffic could have looked like on the branch. As I mentioned, the Philip Morris plant uh, was on the north side of the branch and they were a major producer of Marlboro cigarettes. In fact, I, uh, I think that's where most Marlboros were actually probably made at that plant. Uh, when this picture was made, I couldn't find it. I didn't take it, but I can't find any evidence of the siding. By then, they may not have been served by rail, or it may have come in from another direction. <clears throat> uh, a little bit further west, uh, looking from 21st Street, uh, you can see on the left the General Box Company warehouses. By this time, I'm pretty sure they were taken over by Brown Foreman, because you can see a conveyor connecting Brown Foreman with the warehouses on the side. More importantly, this is the reason the branch stayed alive for so many years. Those are tank cars that had brought Canadian whiskey down to uh, here to be bottled by Brown Foreman. So there was quite a bit of movement of tank cars in and out of the Brown Foreman facility. They also brought vodka from Finland up there to be bottled also. Uh, anyway, the um, branch continued on westward and these pictures, the next couple of pictures were taken really by the time the branch was abandoned, but you can kind of get an idea. The right of way was tight. It went through residential and small industrial areas. And, uh, and most places where it crossed the streets, there were just cross bucks on a sign. There were no signals or anything across the street. No, no, no gates, no flashing lights or anything like that. Now we're getting to the extreme west end of the branch where it terminated. Uh, you can see the how it became double track for a short period of time because they needed to run around to serve the various facing point and trailing point spurs on the industry. 
For a short time, it crossed 28th Street and went into girdler tube turns. This was a World War II branch line or extension for the war effort. And the agreement was that it would be taken out when the war was over. In 1950, the city engineer, Mr. Tubby Sanders, was asked, how come that track's still in there? The Courier Journal asked him that question. And he said, I don't rightly believe that this war has been over yet. There was no peace treaty. And he was right. But basically, he was just covering, as you know what, they had probably forgotten to tell somebody to take it out. So whatever the case, it, it uh, lasted until the end of the war and then was taken out. So for all practical purposes, the branch ended at Sunnybrook Distillery at 28th and Broadway. This is looking at the east end of what be the double track section. I have a feeling that uh, Conrail had a need for some rail somewhere and this fit the bill and out it came. But anyway, uh, this is the, where the switch was to start the runaround section at the east end so that they could switch the industries at the west end. Uh, and the, another Sanborn insurance map, you can see where the switch was. If you look at the right side of the map, you'll see where the switch was, it was in the photo. And you see the, a spur track, well, one spur serving uh, buildings to the side, which is uh, John Wild Construction. At one time, it was Anderson Woodworking. It said manufacturing, but it was Anderson Woodworking is what they normally called it. And then you had Louisville Hay and Grain and uh, a coal company at one time, and then later a chemical company spur to the south. Uh, Louisville Hay and Grain became Sterling Heating Company. Uh, the tracks to unload came in on the opposite side from what we're looking at. The, uh, it looks like right now, looking at the fact there's only a chute on one of these uh, silos, that that's probably the only one that was still in use. But back in the day when you had different grades of domestic coal, uh, these different silos could carry those different grades of coal. One more thing. It, I've thought about it. one way you could do this compressed is that Walters kit on the Walters coal uh, facility, the coal yard. Uh, it's similar, or you could take a couple and put them together if you wanted to make it larger. Uh, this is the track that curved around to the north. It served um, different companies at one time or another. Liggett and Platt was a company that made bed springs and also the uh, frames for recliner chairs. Um, before that, it had been a, a mop company and different things. But way before that, it was the old Fortuna distillery. And uh, no, you're not wrong. If you look down at the bottom, you see all the writings in German. Uh, that was an ad in the Louisville German language newspaper is how that ended up that way. But what was interesting was the warehouse in the distance with the odd window pattern. And there it is today. I always thought that would be an interesting thing for someone to kit bash. It was a whiskey warehouse originally. Now it belongs to a storage company. But I just thought the window pattern was somewhat unique. Probably used to uh, aid the, the, the walls, the structural integrity of the walls. As I said, the branch ended at Sunnybrook Distillery, uh, the large complex pretty much in the center of the picture. The reason why you see all these reflections is because everything's underwater. The only picture I could take by the area was during the 1937 flood, which, you know, about 70 to 80% of the city of Louisville was underwater during the 1937 flood. But anyway, it kind of gives you an, an idea of how big the complex was. The vacant area to the um, uh, left was where Tube Turns Girdler would be during World War II. Okay, let's kind of look at the branch over the years, uh, equipment wise. This is a JM and I switch engine at Maple Street, about two blocks north of uh, Arbogast. Uh, the picture was taken in 1893, and it was a switch crew that was switching some grain elevators that existed on Maple Street at that time. I have no doubt this engine would also have been found on the Arbogast Street branch, probably later in the same day. Uh, as things modernized, so did the motive power, and here is a Pennsylvania switch engine at the Portland Roundhouse. Uh, you can tell off to the uh, right, you can bar barely see the water tank or water tub that was adjacent to the Roundhouse. 
uh, if you go down there today, the buildings in the background are still there. Everything else is gone. Uh, look at General Box Company again, just to talk about what kind of rolling stock would you find? What would you need to switch this thing? Most of the tr cars used were box cars. But almost every commodity was hauled in. Uh, bottles, whiskey, grain, wood, hauled out uh, the barrels of uh, bottles of whiskey, the finished uh, boxes, pallets, uh, tobacco products, everything it was all came in and went out on box cars. Probably a few hopper cars to serve some coal facilities and other than that, mostly box cars. Things started changing uh, in the 60s, maybe the 50s and 60s. This is a uh, Pennsylvania switch crew on the Arbogast Street branch on Lewis Avenue. Uh, that, that was the extreme end of the branch at West End. It actually paralleled and was in the right of way of Lewis Avenue. Now you see a little difference. So there's a couple of covered hoppers behind that box car. Probably brought grain into Sunnybrook Distillery, which if you look over to the top of the steam engine, you'll see the top of the Sunnybrook smokestack with Sunny. You can see the Sunny on the Sunnybrook smokestack. Uh, the caboose was probably used pretty much as what we would call today a shoving platform. It looked like it was in pretty rough shape and it was just used to go up and down the branch and also back, uh, with cuts going back and forth across the bridge. Um, I think that uh, they would want their crews looking a little more professional these days than maybe they did back then, but whatever. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was going to, uh, anyway, eventually the Conrail shed a lot of branch lines and main, even main lines all across the country. Some of them spun off the regional railroads. And one of these was the Louisville, uh, Louisville and Indiana Railroad that took over the uh, Jeffersonville, the Louisville branch between Jeffersonville and Indianapolis. And of course, the L and I began operating the Arbogast Street along with everything else. Uh, from their terminal and uh, yard in Jeffersonville, they would put the cars together and then bring them over to Arbogast Street and on down to Kentucky Street. Uh, and they they interchanged by the canal with one with uh, Norfolk Southern. They went down to quite a few places in Louisville along the Kentucky Street branch. Uh, the new paint scheme, the old paint, the green and yellow is the old, the old, the sort of a maroon or color is the new. Again, they used the uh, bridge across the Ohio River. The bridge was rebuilt around 1916 using the original piers from the 1870 bridge. And of course, a dam was built to kind of block the falls of the Ohio at that point. But anyway, uh, that's the bridge that's used today. Also, it's used by CSX these days. Uh, the last industry that was served was the Brown Foreman Distillery. Again, you can see the, the whiskey bottle. Uh, that was always a great landmark in Louisville years and years ago was the Brown Foreman whiskey bottle. And they, they updated as they changed the labels from time to time. Uh, here's a uh, L and I train leaving. Uh, it's crossing there at uh, 15th street behind beside the old Bernheim uh, bottling plant. But what it's doing, it's got empty tank cars from Brown Foreman getting ready to take them back to Jeffersonville. What do you see on the Arbogast today? No, yeah, not a whole lot. Uh, Brown Foreman has quit receiving the tank cars of whiskey. Um, right now, the branch is being used to store cement hoppers. Uh, apparently, they had one group in there. They Trees grew up through them. They cut the trees down, moved them out, and moved some more in. To the left is the old Bernheim Distillery, which is now operated by Heaven Hill. It replaced the facility they had that burned in Bardstown about 20 years ago. Um, unfortunately, no rail service. The American Tobacco Company plant is gone. Uh, now it's a YMCA uh, and a community center, and I think even a bank is, is in the facility. And it just brings to mind, if you're interested in something, you say, hey, I'd like to get a picture of that. Go do it because you may go down there and suddenly your big tobacco plants turned into a YMCA. So I uh, just something to do, something to remember. Uh, going westward, you, there's no evidence of the branch. 
nowhere can you find it. Where Brown Foreman, uh, uh, where Sunnybrook Distillery was, uh, is now a Super Kroger's and a, and a McDonald's. So it just shows you things are gone. Um, modeling the branch. Um, I have a, I have a short spur on my small switching layout, and basically I kind of the idea came from the Arbogast Street branch. You can see the building in the background is my version of the Goodwin Preserving Company, not very much so, but I just used some uh, the Walters Cornerstone modulars to put it together. Um, whether I'd ever do it that way again, I'm not so sure. <laughs> but anyway, that's what way I did that one. So I took a different approach. Tom Gunther. Uh, looked at it when we've been down on the Arbor Gust a few times and when he decided to build his uh, L and N railroad based primarily on Eastern Kentucky, he built an industrial spur uh, for Harlan and kind of inspired it has the same features as Arbor Gust, tight quarters, lots of spurs, trailing and fa facing points and you have to uh, short run around tracks to get around everything. Uh, anybody that on his way out to his work, uh, Harlan knows that we lock you in there and won't let you out until you get finished. Anyway, here's another view of Harlan and uh, Tom's take on the Kentucky Mine Supply Company. If everyone, anyone's ever been to Harlan, Kentucky, that's probably the largest structure in the entire town. And it's kind of famous for the sign on top of it, Kentucky Mine Supply Company. So. Yeah, do you model Arbogast as it is? No, you don't have to. Uh, but just any switching thing, just kind of use maybe ideas to kind of put together a concept. Okay, where did I find out about all this stuff? Obviously, on the ground rail fanning. Um, myself, uh, Rick Tipton, uh, Tom Guntner, others, we have gone down there and run back and forth across this thing several times. Uh, Louisville Free Public Library. Some of the uh, information I got was from the clippings files in the library. When I did this, you had to physically go in there. Now you could still have to go in a, a library branch, but you're going to get access to most of that off of their internal system. Also, you can check newspapers and that online uh, through the website for the Louisville Free Public Library. Filson Historical Society, which is pretty much a private organization, but the public can go in. And that's where I got the hard copies of the insurance maps. A great thing is University of Louisville Digital Archives, especially access to the photo archives and historic maps in the area. Railpictures.net, uh, you can spend hours going through railpictures.net. And like I said, uh, fellow rail fans who helped me out. Those are just some of the sources that I use when developing this and putting it together. So that's basically it. If you have any questions, uh, we will try to work out the, the system to uh, answer them. Other than that, um, that's, that's about all I have. I'm gonna go ahead and... Good job, Bob. Yeah, great job, Bob. Great, great job. job. There were no Thank questions in, uh, in chat who went by. Uh, any questions for Bob? Throw him out there. He's ready. I think he's ready for his author certificate. <laughs> I don't, more than. I don't yeah. see any questions, but, but so, uh, but like I said, if you have any, any time, just uh, send me an email, or if you want to get a link to some source, let me know, and I'll try to help you out. Thank you very, very much. All righty, guys, and that is the end of our Division 8 meeting for today. Thank you all very much for joining. I uh, hope you uh, learned something today and had a good experience. Uh, we'll well done. Be again in another month in May. And uh, as I said, we'll do a couple of things in groups IO yes, and see if, uh, awesome. informally in between. Thank you much. Have a great day and be safe out there. Yeah, okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.